received those iPads, remember that day? I was pretty excited about that. Because I really like to play games. I, I know that's horrible to say, but I, every year of your uh, high school career, I had a different game that I was obsessed with. And it started with, in the best possible way, because I love my daughter. And she loves My Little Pony. And so the first game that I put uh, on the iPad was My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. It was a wonderful game. Right, it's kind of like Heyday. Does anybody play Heyday a little bit? Give money, you can buy ponies like Twilight Sparkle, Rainbow Dash. My favorite is Twilight Sparkle. And it was, a, it was a wonderful game. But as you can probably predict, it was more for me than it was for her. I, you, I, I got it, and I played this way, way, way too much. And it became even worse when some of, uh, some of you introduced me to the game uh, Clash of Clans. I love this game. Thank you. Uh, my wife does not thank you, though. Um, and uh, I had to get this game off my iPad very, very quickly because I played this way, way too much. And then finally, uh, if you remember your junior year, you introduced me to the philosopher Kim Kardashian. <laughs> and in her game, Kim Kardashian, uh, Hollywood, I believe it was called, uh, in which you can create an avatar. Uh, that's me up there, that's my uh, digital self. <laughs> Dirk, you can call me now that you're graduated. And if you notice, you have two choices in uh, Kim Kardashian, Hollywood. You can network or you can flirt. Two choices. Now these games have a lot in common actually, right? The, uh, they have in common that it's really about success, and success is gaining more. More and more stuff, and they're never ending. Now the game that I really struggled to quit, if I'm going to be straight up honest, was a game that's really quite silly. It's the game Flappy Bird. Did anyone play this game Flappy Bird? Uh, who, who played this game? One time, one time. I, so I watched you play this game. Never in my class of four pop books, right? Right, good. Okay. Uh, so I watched you play this game, and I said, I can do this. I know I can. And so I downloaded the app. It was free. It was free. Nice. And I started playing. And I tried it. I tried it. You know, you just, oh, it's a pretty easy game. I just tap the screen, and your little bird flaps and bounces right around. So I prepped, I uh, tapped it, and I couldn't get through one pipe for a really long time. Did anyone have this issue? It looked so easy, and then you uh, couldn't get through. No, you, you, you were great right from the beginning. But then there was one time, and this is a really meaningful moment for me. I got nine on Flappy Bird. I know. Thank you. Thank you. It was kind of a big deal. It was kind of a big deal. I felt really, really good about myself. And I went to the next class that I had, and I said to them, I got a nine on Flappy Bird. And they kind of just stared at me for a little bit. I was, I was expecting the applause that I got. And instead, they, uh, one of them said, so what? I got 56. <laughs> and yet I kept on playing this really dumb game. Look at this thing. Yeah, like it's, it's stole its animation from Mario. It uh, doesn't have any goal of variety. You just keep on playing the same thing over and over again, one pipe to the next. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But I played this thing so much that when I closed my eyes, I would still see those stupid birds flapping away, going from one thing to the next, over and over again. And it was really, really bad. And I wasn't alone. If you uh, go to the next slide, uh, here is a uh, tweet by uh, Melissa. Melissa? Melissa, I believe. Um, to the creator of Flappy Bird. This is what she said. Flappy Bird has ruined my life. I've been playing for eight hours. That's like a whole shift. Eight hours straight, and I swear my eyes are bleeding. <laughs> and then the creator of uh, Black Bird, Don Wynn, uh, responds, and I love this, it's just a game. Take care of yourself first. I don't make games to ruin people's lives. <laughs> it's just a game. It's just a game. Now, none of you play Black Bird anymore, I don't think. One of the reasons it went off the iTunes store, we'll talk about that later, but none of you play this game anymore. And now we look at this like, really? I spent that much time on this? How much time do you guys spend? Anybody spend more than an hour at a time on uh, Flappy Bird? A little bit here there. Not eight hours, at least, right? Not eight hours. But we did. And so what we do when we're bored with a game is we move on to the next game, right? And then we do. Uh, we're like, all right, I'll try uh, whatever I am. Let's play Clash of Clans or something, right? Flappy Bird plays like Clash of Clans. 
And in some ways, we do the same thing with any experience, right? We replace high school with college. We replace one friend group with the next. And we, it's kind of the same game, kind of the same rules, but just a different setting. And so I want to deal with this game, this cultural game that we all find ourselves in. Because I think it actually does connect with the game of Flappy Bird quite well. Because here we have a game and the goal and the experience that never ends. Never ends. And it gives you a game that you'll never be satisfied with. See, this cultural game begins, as a lot of games do, with the best of intentions. If you have adults in your life to kind of speak into this. They give you a standard of success, like 99, oh, 999,000. I think that was actually hacked. Uh, that was, uh, that's actually on the leaderboard uh, right now. Uh, and they give you a standard of success that you uh, must measure up. And the adults mean well when they say this, right? They're trying to inspire you. They're trying to make you better. They think, all right, if we give a standard, uh, a standard of success, like a grade, for instance, that will make them work hard, work really hard. It's all good intentions. But these good intentions don't uh, take away from the dark side of that leaderboard, that cultural leaderboard. Because this cultural leaderboard tells you that you will never be, that you will never have enough. <coughs> I know that's not what I'm supposed to say on graduation. <laughs> but this is the way of the cultural game. It gives you a standard of success that moves once you get near it. It tells you to compare your score, your grade, your weight, your points, your paycheck to the person next to you. You're in constant competition to be better than. Always someone will you. Think about grades. Uh, you get a 92% on an essay, and you're feeling kind of good. So you realize someone right next to you got the exact same score. It's like, really? I got the same score as her? Like, come on now. Or you get the, uh, you got to the uh, 98 and you realize that someone got 99. And suddenly that 98 doesn't mean as much, right? Because it's in comparison that we find value and meaning. And this is horrible. Now, I know you know this. Mallory did a nice job already speaking to this. Because you know this. You know that wealth and power and success and pleasure and grace and all those things, right? You know that them will never satisfy. You know that it's never any game. We can even quote verses, right? We can quote, uh, but seek first his kingdom and all his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We know not to store treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt. We know this. We say wonderful things. Advance God's kingdom. But is this what our lives, our dreams, our thoughts really say? Could we think we're pursuing and advancing God's kingdom and are really just playing a game of Flappy Bird? Frederick Baker says this, If you want to know who you are, watch your feet. Because where your feet take you, that's who you are. In, in, in other words, there's a separation between our words and what we say we actually believe and our actions. And sometimes they take us in very, very different places. And it's our actions that reveal what type of game we're in. So if you want to know who you are, watch your feet. Because where your feet take you, that's who you are. One of the ways to figure out what kind of game you're playing is what happens when you lose something. What happens when these things that you value so much are taken away from you? Or how often does the thought of losing fill you with dread? I think some of you know this feeling. I've had to talk to a lot of you about this. I've talked to you a lot about uh, some of you who have struggled a lot this year. You struggled with uh, panic attacks. You struggled with doubt. You struggled with depression. You struggled with anger that you couldn't control. And for many of you, you might have felt you already lost the game. You went, uh, you went through a horrible breakdown. A friend group rejected you. Right before graduation. You didn't get the scholarship. You were never as good in the court as your brother or your sister. You so well to be. This happened this year, I know it did. And you felt like everything that made you you was taken away from you. I had a season of anger and bitterness when my game wasn't working for me a couple of uh, years ago. It was about four years ago. Uh, my game of uh, trying to gain approval from almost every single human being in the world, well, it wasn't working for me too well. 
as you can imagine. So I was ticked off at people. And, and if I'm going to be honest, I was ticked off at God. And I found myself playing, we used to have cassette tapes, uh, I, I, I found myself playing a cassette tape in my head over and over again, and I'd play these voices of things and events that I felt where people had wronged me. I'd just rewind, play it again, rewind, play it again. And when I closed my eyes, just like I saw that game of Flappy Bird, I, I heard those voices and I relived that moment, those moments over and over again. So I was playing the wrong game. And so I went on a spiritual retreat to the uh, Franciscan uh, Center in Lowell. And it was there I had to face two things that I've been trying to avoid my whole life. Uh, silence, as you can imagine. And being alone. Because it was there I had absolutely no one to impress. I had uh, no one I had to try to get to like me. It was just me and God. And I prayed. And at first I prayed to, uh, uh, to forgive uh, the people that I felt had wronged me, but then I realized I needed to ask forgiveness uh, because I was playing the wrong game. It's a game of revenge, of anger, and I had to let it go. It's interesting. Uh, the creator of uh, Flappy Bird uh, actually had to let go of his own game. You remember this when I was off the iTunes store? Uh, there were people who were horrified, very angry. I don't know why, but they were. You see, the, the creator of Flappy Bird, he actually had it all. Like, this guy had the top game of the iTunes store. He was making $50,000 a day on ad revenue. Like, that's what we talk about as success, right? And then he gave it up and he took it off the iTunes store. Because he saw what it really was. This is what he said. I recall Flappy Bird, a success of mine but also lives my simple life. So now I hate it. What everyone was telling him would bring him happiness, economic success, fame. He finally saw for what it was. Do you remember when he told that girl? What was that? Do you remember what it was? It's just a game. And what he lost by chasing after this game was a simple life. And this simple life cannot be found in the comparison culture. And the simple life can only be found by participating in God's kingdom reality. And the only way to participate in this reality is when we turn Flappy Bird upside down. I like this. If you play Flappy Bird upside down, it's about a fish that keeps floating to the surface. Uh, the goal in advancing God's kingdom is not to win. It's not to gain power. It's not to conquer land for this kingdom. Because that would be kind of dumb. Every square inch already belongs to God. You don't need to conquer land that's already part of a kingdom. And to bring about this kingdom requires a new way of seeing and acting. At the school, we recognize the potential for a flappy bird game within each discipline. And we try to provide an upside-down reality. Uh, in science, we recognize that science could be a game about survival of the fittest. But we see each human being as created in God's image and a gift to be cherished. The game of history could tell us it's all about, the game is all about power and control and empire. But we say that we want to tell the story of the oppressed and those who lost. Well, math could be a game of human beings as statistics and collateral. We see each human being as more than statistics, but that you are created in God's order and logic. English could be a game of verbal manipulation, self-promotion. But we see language as a way to bring power to the powerless and a voice to the voiceless. And here's the cool thing. You're already advancing God's kingdom this year. Mel and I already brought up a, a couple of really good examples. When Tyler was killed, he resisted the game that calls for hatred and revenge. And I remember one of you praying for this. And not go to that path. Instead, you advance God's kingdom by mourning with Madawa and raising money for his family. When flooding occurred, uh, was occurring in the backyards and portage, you resisted the game that said, well, it's not my backyard. 
and he got dirty in environmental science with Mr. Dyke by removing the beaver dam that was causing it. In the senior spiritual retreat, the guys resisted the game, the game's insistence that vulnerability equals weakness. By opening up and sharing some of your darkest struggles and saying that I can't do this on my own. When you were told that you could leave a little early from your last day of your senior life, senior life, high school life, you came back to my class to support each other as you read your heartfelt and personal this I believe essays. You advanced God's kingdom every time you thought of another person first. So, as you move from here, here to there, you aren't substituting one game for our success for another. That's only the way to anxiety and despair. Instead, hold fast to the promise that your God has already came. You can't do this on your own. You need a community, you need people around you. Because we all need help. We all need help to watch our feet, show us where they're going. We need to find a community that can speak for life-giving practices. Value simplicity, justice, and who can refocus you when you're tempted by another earth game. It's not going to be easy. Jesus said, in this world you will have trials. But he also said, take heart. I've overcome the world. And the good news is the game has already won. Thank you so much.